Welcome to a lesson with Dr. Powell. We're going to look at a proof for why the ring of integers of a number field has unique factorization of ideals into prime ideals. We're going to um, discuss some characteristics of, um, ring of rings of integers, which will make this happen and possible at first, um, or some properties of, ring of rings of integers. Um, these properties uh, amount to saying that the ring of integers is a Dedekind domain. So let's look at these properties. First, if we take a prime ideal in OK, we know that its index in OK is finite. And in particular, we also know since P is prime that um, if you mod out by, by P, you get an integral domain. And finite integral domains are fields which means that P is maximal. So the collection of maximal ideals is exactly equal to the collection of prime ideals here. Um, one little description for why a finite integral domain is a field is given right here. If you take non-zero elements and multiply it by them, that's like having an injective homomorphism and the domain and codomain are finite. Um, it's injective because of uh, what it means to be an integral domain. Um, you have a nice cancellation. Um, since things are finite here, this injective map is actually surjective. Um, so AR is equal to R, which means that AR, which includes one, um, we we can we um, we know we can find an inverse for A. So A times that inverse will be equal to one, and so we have inverses. Um, so we have a field. OK, we, we're going to also use the idea that OK is Noetherian. All ascending chains of ideals eventually stabilize. Um, and also that OK is integrally closed. So already OK is the collection of elements of K that are roots of monic polynomials with coefficients in Z. But what if instead we took co uh, roots of roots of um, that it live in K, that are roots of monic polynomials with coefficients not in Z, but in OK. Now, that condition, um, which is a little stronger, actually will guarantee that we're, um, <clears throat> will actually guarantee that we're um, back in OK again. That if we, that if our element is in K, and it's a root of a polynomial of coefficients in OK, it's actually also a root of a root of a polynomial of coefficients in Z. Um, now, if we think about this for just a minute, let's suppose that gamma is a root of such a polynomial of coefficients in OK. So these A N guys are in OK. Now, um, each of these can be represented in terms of a Z basis for OK as a as a free Z module. Um, and then we can we can take so if we take that basis for OK as a free Z module and freely multiply it to powers of gamma. And so we kind of think about a free Z module with um, this big mega basis, which kind of products of things from this basis and powers of gamma um, um, all the way up to gamma N. And um, and then what we can do is we can use uh, this relation. So we can always reduce powers of gamma n down to uh, lower powers right here. So that using that relation, we actually get that multiplication by gamma just on that finite um, basis here, the z basis, um, in this free z module with that one uh, but modded out by that one relation here, um, actually gives um, that uh, gamma that multiplication by gamma is a is a z module homomorphism here, um, which means it's a root of a characteristic polynomial in z, um, which is what we wanted to show. Okay, so we have this integrally closed condition, and um, let's look at a lemma. Let's take any ideal in OK. We uh, propose that it contains a product of primes. So proof, we're going to use the Noetherian property of the ring of integers. Suppose that we take the collection of all counterexamples. So ideals that don't contain 
products, any product primes. All right. Now, if we take any chain in C as we move along, eventually that chain in OK itself stabilizes. So there's only finitely many places to go before it stabilizes. Once you hit a place where it's um, where it's um, out of C, then forever after it would be out of C because um, it would contain the same product of primes that allowed us to not be in C anymore. Um, there'll be a maximal point um, in that chain where we're still in C, which means that all chains in C are have an upper bound in C, which means by Zorn's lemma, that there exists a ma maximal counterexample, and we'll just call it E. So there's a maximal counterexample E. Um, all right. Um, so if we have anything that can, any ideal that contains E non-trivially, it'll be out of C. So it'll actually contain a product of primes. So we can assume that we have a maximal counterexample. No, no, E is not prime because if it were, it would contain itself, which is a product of primes. So, since E is not prime, we're gonna we're gonna use that idea. If we take alpha and beta such that their product is in this counterexample E, um, that um, and we can choose alpha and beta that we can choose alpha and beta that are such that their product is in this counterexample E, but alpha and beta both are not in E. That's because E is not prime. If E were prime, whenever this happens, then at least one of these guys would be an E. Um, and since that's the defining idea to make a prime, so if it's not prime, then you're going to have a counter. You're going to have a counterexample to that idea. Alpha, there exists alpha and beta such that their product is an E, but n neither of these guys are an E. Hmm. Well, we know that E is non-trivially contained in this ideal, the yeah, smallest ideal that's generated by, or the ideal that's generated by alpha and E, um, that's because alpha is not an E right here, and beta is not an E as well. So because of that, it this ideal non-trivially contains E, this ideal non-trivially contains E, and E is maximal. It's a counterexample, which means that these guys actually contain products of primes, or at least one product of primes. So, um, and if you multiply them together, um, then that product should contain the product of, of uh, a product of primes these guys contain. So this product should contain a product of primes. But now let's look at this product for a minute using the idea that alpha and beta is in E. So if you look at this product, it expands out like this. But notice since alpha times beta is an E, this guy is an E. This guy's an E. That guy's an E. That's all of them are E. It's an E, which means the product of primes is an E, but E wasn't supposed to do that. So it's a contradiction. So we've just shown that even that maximal counterexample could um, still wasn't a counterexample. So it's a contradiction there. So we know that all our ideals actually contain products of primes. All right. Now let's define the um, what we'll call the fractional inverse of the prime P. So it's going to be all elements in the field K, such that when we multiply them to the prime, we land in OK. Now we know that OK is contained in this fractional inverse um, because OK times P is in is in P, which is definitely an OK. But in this lemma, we propose that um, that P inverse non-trivially contains OK. So um, that is um, P inverse contains elements which are um, which are not in OK. So it's bigger than it. All right. So here's our proof. Let's take an element of a prime ideal, and let's look at the principal ideal generated by it. Um, we know by our last lemma that it actually will contain a product of primes. We're going to let m be the minimum number of primes that occur in all the products that occur of primes. I mean, m could I even be all the way down to one, perhaps. Um, OK, we just know that they, they contain pro a product. OK, so m is the minimum number. So let's let's look at this minimal case then. Minimal, minimal maximal cases are nice for proofs. Um, yeah. So let's look at this. So let's say the prime. I, so we have this principal ideal contains that contains P1 through P, 
through PM, where M is the minimum number. Um, and uh, all right. And um, we can assume that loss generality that this first guy, P1, is actually equal to P itself, where X is an element of P. Hmm, why is that true? Well, P is a prime ideal. And if you have the product of two ideals, which is contained in there, so let's think about this. Let's separate this out, like P1 times P2 through PM. Let's just do those. So P1 times P2 through PM, that's a product of ideals, of two ideals, P1 and the rest of it, which is contained in P. Then actually one part, one part of that product, either this ideal or that other ideal, is contained in P. Why is that? Well, if one of them wasn't in P, then you can find an element of that guy which is not in P itself. And in the product, you're going to have that guy, so suppose it's R, times the other ideal, J. And that's definitely going to be in the product, which is contained in P. Hmm. So this whole product, so R times all of J is in P. But wait a minute, since P is prime, and you have two things multiplied together that are in P, one of them has to be in P. So since R is not, that means all of J must be in P. So J is actually contained in P. So we get that one part of this product, one of these ideals, so if you have even just two ideals, so uh, I, did I, I times J is in P, then you know that either all of I is in P or all of J is in P. So this idea for primes um, for with, with elements actually works with ideals as well. So we can kind of look at that. So if we... So if P1 is in P, then, then uh, we have a prime containing another prime, since primes have to be maximal here, here and the only prime that contains um, that a prime contains is itself, then P1 would have to be P in that case. But if it weren't, then P2 through PM would be in P, and we could repeat the argument and eventually find one of these guys that is actually contained in P, so it must be P. So after re-indexing and reordering, we could just say without loss of generality that P1 is equal to P. All right, so we got that. Okay, so let's assume P1 is P. All right, by minimality, the product, the rest of the product is, well, that's less than M things, so we know that it can't be contained in the ideal that we're working with, X of K, all right? So it can't be contained in here, which contains this product of primes because M was minimal. Now we have a product that has less things in it. What if M were equal to uh, one? So this product, so the rest of the product would just simply be okay then itself. Um, and okay would not be would uh, would not be contained in here. Um, so the, so this product would just be okay, and it wouldn't be contained in here because X is an element of prime ideal, and that this can't be all of okay. So um, so we're, we're Basically, we can get an element which is in here, which could be okay, um, and uh, which will not be in here. So that's what we're going to do right here. We're going to pick such an alpha, such an element there. And notice that alpha times P, all right, is going to be, so, so alpha times P, think about alpha. Alpha is contained in all of this. Um, right, so alpha times P is contained in um, P times all of that, okay? And um, you know that this product is contained in X, okay? Because remember what this P was, it was P1, and this was precisely the product that was contained in X, okay? Um, and we know that alpha is contained in the rest of that, so put them together, it's contained there. So, okay, so we know that alpha P is contained in X, okay? And in particular, by dividing out by x, you know that uh, alpha over x p is contained in OK. Um, well, since oh, alpha over x times p is in OK, that means alpha over x is in p inverse um, by the definition of what p inverse is. It's all elements that multiply to p to put it into OK. That's by the definition of p inverse. Um, but you, we also chose alpha by construction so that alpha was not in X okay. Which means that um, 
So uh, if we cancel out by X, we're not going to be in OK anymore um, here in this. So alpha over X is not an OK. OK, so alpha over X is not an OK, but it is in P inverse. So we found an element of P inverse, which is not an OK, which means that P inverse non-trivially contains OK. So it's bigger than OK. All right, let's look at the definition of a fractional ideal. All right, um, which uh, P inverse is a um, an example of. So we're gonna take any non-zero ideal, which are any non-zero, uh, we'll say OK module, which is a subset of K. So this uh, doesn't have to live in OK itself. This is just an OK module which is a subset of K such that if that there exists an element of OK itself, that multiplication by it will send it into OK. OK, so um, uh, let's take a look at P inverse here and, and look at it in this in terms of this definition. So if, if X is in P, then um, X times P inverse is in OK. Um, that's why the definition of P inverse, because P inverse is, is uh, the set of everything that multiplied to all of P will put it into OK. So if you take anything in P in particular, then P inverse times it will be in OK. All oh, right. So, all right. So we satisfied this. Um, so we satisfied this part right here. And we also know that P inverse is an OK module. Let's look at the definition of P inverse here. Um, so if you take any two guys such that multiplication by them sends put, puts you in OK. If you add them together, we'll still do the same thing. Um, multiplication and all of that. It looks like we're going to have a, um, uh, it's going to be an OK module. Um, and so we get that P inverse is an example of a fractional ideal um, with this particular definition. Now, we notice in particular, because we have this for any element of X in P, that P times P inverse is contained in OK. Um, okay, and we know that P times inverse, P inverse, so if we multiply um, two guys kind of that uh, fractional ideals, we're going to get a fra another fractional ideal. So um, so P times P inverse is lives in OK and is a fractional ideal, OK? So it's an ideal in OK. So P times P inverse is an ideal in OK. We want to take a look and see what it's equal to. We know that P times P inverse um, contains OK. Um, let's see. Let's see. Oh, our, our P inverse contains OK. And we know that P times P inverse is contained in OK. Um, and we also know that since P inverse contains OK, that uh, this guy contains P times OK, which is P itself. So, so P times P inverse is sandwiched in between P, which is maximal, and OK which means that P times P inverse is either equal to P or it's equal to OK. Well, in the case that it's equal to P, that means that um, all the elements of P inverse, um, as thought of as multiplication, produce, um, um, o produce OK module homomorphisms from P to P, which um, mean that uh, you can, which mean that they are, um, can be thought of as a root of a monic polynomial with coefficients in OK. So kind of a characteristic polynomial of a matrix representing such a homomorphism. So, um, and by um, integral closure, um, that's actually going to be an element of, of OK itself. So. So if this is equal to this, then that means all the elements of P inverse are actually live in O, um, live in, live in OK. So, but but we know we showed earlier that P inverse actually contains um, a non-integral element or an element that's not in OK. So um, so that's a contradiction right there. So it cannot be equal to P. So the only other option that it's equal to OK. OK, so P times P inverse is actually equal to OK. All right, so that works for prime ideals. Now, let's um, let I be any ideal of OK. 
and we have a question here. Does there exist um, a fractional ideal, which we can label as I inverse, so that their product, I and I inverse, is equal to OK? Um, we know that this works with when I is prime, but, um, but what about um, just overall? So again, we use this Noetherian property um, of OK. Let's let C be the collection of all counterexamples. Let's look at chains in C. These guys have a, there's a maximal, every one of these chains has a maximal point, which is in C. So every chain has an upper bound um, in C. So we can use Zorn's lemma to find a, a maximal counterexample here. So that if you go, if anything contains it non-trivially, you'll be out of C and, um, and it'll have an inverse. Okay. So um, I is not a prime but it is contained in a um but um it is contained in a maximal ideal which is a prime and it's contains um, non-trivially because now we know it's not a prime because um we just showed that primes have um have inverses and i is assumed not to have an inverse okay so we have some prime that contains it non-trivially now um, now let's look at this product I times P inverse where P is the one guy that contains I. So P inverse contains OK, which means I, um, which in particular you could think I times OK is just I. So, um, at smallest, this would be equal to I, but, um, at largest, let's see, um, I is contained in P, right? And, you know, P times P inverse is equal to OK. So, you know, at largest, it's, um, since I is contained in P at largest, it's OK, and at smallest, it's I, or it's between. OK, so we have, um, so I times P inverse is somewhere in here. At smallest, it's I. Um, at largest, it's OK. Um, right, because I is contained in P, and P times P inverse is OK. All right, so it's somewhere between there. OK, so I times P inverse, let's suppose that it were equal to I. If it's equal to I, then um, all the elements of P inverse would be like, home, like uh, OK, module homomorphisms and by integral closure would say that they're all actually um, roots of monics um, in coefficients of Z. In other words, they're all in OK, but we know P inverse non-trivially contains an OK, so that would be a contradiction. Um, so we know it can't be this. So that means that I times P inverse non um, it uh, actually non-trivially contains, um, contains I. OK, in particular, we know that it contains I because P inverse um, contains OK. OK, so it non-trivially contains it. Um, so that ends, I was a maximal counterexample, which means that this guy right here actually has an inverse. Let's call that because it's out of C, so it has an inverse. Call the inverse J. Um, and you know that I times P inverse times J inverse right here is actually equal to okay because um j is the inverse of it um okay well oh i guess j inverse is the inverse of it. j is not the inverse j is just equal to the I, ideal I, I times p inverse okay so i times p inverse has um we're naming it as j and it's inverse is j inverse okay so we know that this product is equal to okay and since this product is equal to okay look at this right here p inverse times j inverse that times i is equal to okay. Wait a minute, that's an inverse of i. But i was supposed to be um, in c, maximal in c. And c is a set of counterexamples where you don't have something times something to get your okay, which means that we have a contradiction. So i actually does have a fractional inverse. Okay, let's look at how we can actually write that, um, that down. What we just sh showed is this. If you take any ideal in okay, there exists a fractional inverse to it. Um, so then when they multiply together to give you exactly okay. 
Um, let's look at this description right here. Why don't we, let's, let's let L be the set of all X um, in K, that is, such that X, H um, is contained in L, K. Um, okay, clearly, um, so H inverse, all right, um, so H inverse times H is equal to okay, so it puts you in. So all of H inverse is actually contained in L in this description. But now let's suppose that we have um, some X such that XH is an okay. Um, then we know that um, uh, H inverse is an okay module so that XH um, living in OK times H inverse will be an OK, uh, H inverse again, since H inverse is an OK module there. Um, all right, so we have this containment. We also know that H times H inverse is, um, so that was using this idea that X, uh, so XH is an OK, but now let's use the idea that H times H inverse is OK, which means that X times OK is an H inverse, which in particular, you can pick one in OK if you like, x times 1 is an h inverse. Hey, that means x is an h inverse, which means this description right here is this is the um, is uh, uh, an equivalent description for what h inverse is. So we can actually say h inverse as a set is equal to this. All right. Now let's keep going. Any fractional. Um, so we just showed that um, ideals in OK have fractional inverses. Now, what about any fractional ideal itself? Any fractional ideal has an inverse? Hmm, well, let's think about that. Let's take F as a fractional ideal. So fractional ideals are, you know, don't live in, don't necessarily have to live in okay. They can be outside of it. Um, so let's suppose F is that. And let's suppose that alpha is, um, alpha is some element of OK, such that when we multiply it to F, we get an OK. And we know that there's such an element because um, that's um, one of the things that defines something to be a fractional ideal. So alpha times F is an OK. All right. So, um, uh, so if we take F and we think about um, alpha times F gives you an ideal in OK. Hmm. So ideals in OK have inverses, so we can take the inverse of this, and then if we multiply it by alpha, um, this ends up being the inverse of the inverse of f. Let's think about that for a minute, because uh, multiplication is commutative. Alphas can swing around here, so alpha f and alpha f inverse multiply together gives you OK. Um, so, um, and so just by rearranging, we know that. Um, this equals OK. So this is actually the inverse of F. So every fractional ideal, not just ideals in OK, but every fractional ideal actually has an inverse. Um, in fact, the non-zero fractional ideals actually form an abelian group. OK. So we're still trying to get to the point that we wanted, which is um, that uh, we have um, factorization of ideals uniquely into a product of primes. Um, so let's go here um, now to another lemma. Every non-zero ideal is a you know um, in, I, in OK is a product of primes. Again, we can use the same idea with getting a collection of counterexamples using the Noetherian idea plus Zorn's lemma to get an, a maximal counterexample i. All right, so. We this maximal counterexample i is contained in a prime p, um, and we know that um, this maximal counterexample i is contained in p inverse i. Um, that's because p inverse contains OK. So then that's why we have this inclusion right here, um, and that's. Uh, Okay, and this is contained in, since I is contained in P, this is contained in P inverse P, which is equal to OK. OK, so, um, so I is contained in here, equal that. Okay, now let's look at this. Because P inverse contains um, a non-integral element, um, we know that P inverse I cannot be 
equal to i itself. Okay, so we know so we know that i so p inverse i is between i and p. Um, let's see p inverse. Let's see. Well, it's in p inverse i. It's i. Um, we know the p inverse i. So at you know it can't be equal to i is what I'm trying to say. It can't be equal to i, and that's because um, it has a non-integral element. And if it were equal to i, that means all elements here um, would give you homomorphisms and would you by um, be a root of a polynomial with coefficients in OK, which would get you down to actually live in OK um, by integral closure. Um, so we know that that can't be true. Um, so that means that P inverse, I guess all we're trying to show is that P inverse I is non-trivially contains I. So it contains I, but non-trivially, which means that it's not in C anymore. So um, it actually is equal to a product of primes. Okay, so we know that um, P inverse I is equal to a product of primes. Then that gives us that we take a P times P inverse I, um, which is equal to I, is a product of primes, which is a contradiction. Okay. So again, what is that? That means every non-zero ideal is a product of primes. So we actually know right now that everything is a product of primes. Okay, every ideal. Now let's suppose you have two um, products that are the exact same, you know, to kind of for uniqueness. Okay. <clears throat> and um, we're going to take all these primes in okay here. Um, all right. So um, in particular, you know that this product right here um, is contained in P1 prime. Okay. So this product is contained in all of the different primes here itself. So without loss generality, we could say this one. So this product is contained in P1 prime. Okay. Um, you also know that this product right here is then contained in P1 prime. So you can kind of split it up P1 times something. So, so this ideal times that ideal is in a prime, which means one of these guys has to be in this prime. Um, and, uh, Okay, so keep going and to discover a prime eventually, eventually you can discover a prime that will be contained in P1 prime. And by maximality of primes, um, whatever prime we, we get actually will be equal to P1 prime. So that is, so picking one of these guys here it actually will be over here in that product. Um, we can multiply by the uh, um, fractional inverse of that prime and reduce it down to a smaller um, uh, smaller product on both sides and keep going. Um, eventually, perhaps, I guess the first thing that could happen is we could get OK happening um, on one of the sides. Um, and and if we did, uh, both sides would be okay, and you just have things. Um, um, let's see, multiply by, keep going, um, and then. So if we got okay on one side, remember what we've what we have. All of these are just prime ideals that live in okay. And so we'd get OK is equal to a product of primes that are in OK. There aren't any inverses in here. I mean, these are just, we've just been kind of whittling this down. So we have OK is equal to some product of primes, which would not work um, uh, because it's um, contain, it's a non-trivial containing OK. So that wouldn't work. So what we actually get is that this product of primes actually is exactly equal to the other ones. So we have uniqueness. OK. Um, and we can actually extend this uniqueness to fractional ideals. Take any fraction ideal that exists in alpha and OK, that multiplication by it puts it into OK, and we can write um, uh, alpha times this fractional ideal as a product of primes. Um, now we can also write um, alpha OK, which is um, 
which is an ideal and okay as a product of primes as well, then um, this uh, fractional ideal is equal to multiplication of these um, two products. Um, so now some of these are going to be um, inverses, right? Um, inverse primes. Um, but still, nonetheless, we can write it as a product of powers of primes, even if we think of some of these powers as being negative. And we can do that with um, fractional ideals. Thanks for watching.